So as you guys could probably tell from the title of this video, I'm about to bash Phil Town pretty hard. Not gonna lie, but before I do, I do have to say that without both of his books, Rule One Investing and Payback Time, there is a really good chance I would not have had developed the same level of passion for investing and choosing stocks as I do today. So while I definitely do have a lot of question marks about Phil Town, which we are about to get into, I do have to say that he really did teach me the fundamentals of thinking like a business owner, and he honestly motivated me to begin rethinking how I approach my finances and honestly what I want in life. And because of that, I'll probably always be in some form of debt to him because you know there is some good to fill town but i i don't know uh based off of what i've been seeing in the rule one fund uh i'm beginning to question a lot of his legitimacy so guys i have been following phil town for about four or five years now ever since i got started investing that's that's about how long and ever since he started his rule one fund where you can see the companies that he has been purchasing i always end up scratching my head because based off of what he teaches in his books he is clearly contradicting himself with a bunch of the companies that he chooses to invest in. Secondly, I find it really interesting and bizarre that he considers himself a professional investor where he manages other people's money with the Rule One Fund, yet he has never released his lifelong career performance results. And you know, I don't know why he hasn't done this, but every guru investor, you know, gets their authority from proving what they've done in the past. I mean, I don't know, maybe he just wants to be really humble, which is why he has not released his performance results. However, I really do think the best way and maybe the only way to establish credibility when it comes to your abilities to pick stocks is to release and publicize your career performance and your portfolio performance over a certain amount of time. And honestly, guys, we're going to talk about this part in more detail at the end of the video, but I've been getting a really salesy slash con man vibe from him. You know, I am on his email list and I actually moved him to spam, but he's relentlessly promoting his products and his speeches and his lectures and stuff. And I, I don't know, I'm getting a bad vibe from the guy, but I don't wanna get sidetracked. I wanna look at what he currently owns and I wanna dissect each investment and I wanna compare it to what he has preached in his books. Okay, so I think it would be best advised if we at least think about what Phil Town is looking for in a wonderful company that is selling at a wonderful price, at least according to his rule one book. So let's just go over some of the benchmarks that he has elaborated in detail about in the book and then we're gonna jump into if what he has been preaching is what he is actually doing okay guys so I actually reread part of the book as I was prepping for this video and I jotted down some notes and so one of the things Phil town always talks about is how he is looking to see compounded annual growth over the time frames of 10 years five years three years and the trailing 12 months the last year and he's looking for growth and I think four categories uh, the first one is revenue slash sales the second one is operating cash flow. Uh, the third one is earnings or earnings per share. The fourth one is the book value of equity adjusted for dividends. And he's looking to see all of this growing at an annual growth rate of 10% for those time frames: 10 years, five years, three years, and one year. Additionally, guys, he is looking to see that annual compounded growth rate of 10% in two more categories, which is return on equity and return on invested capital. And again, over those same time frames. The next thing he considers is the balance sheet and he's looking at the debt. Now he does it a little bit differently than probably Manish Babrai or Warren Buffett. And I think it's an interesting way to look at debt, but he likes to see the total outstanding debt relative to one year's earnings. I think his rule of thumb is that if it takes more than three years of current year's earnings power to pay off the debt, then he won't invest. And then of course, the last thing that he preaches pretty hard is the margin of safety. He says in the book that you need to buy with a 50% margin of safety. However, if the company is truly wonderful and you understand it like there is no tomorrow, then you can reduce your margin of safety to like 20 or 30%. Now guys, I just want to say that I think all of those benchmarks are great. And I actually use those benchmarks in my valuation. In fact, I love his benchmarks so much. I pay Phil Town $30 a month to use his rule one toolbox subscription because I genuinely think it is great. Now, just for reference, guys, if a company meets all of his high standards, which it's true, they are high standards, then his very own subscription service, his very own product is going to show a screenshot of something like this where it is all green. Okay, so now I wanna pull up his most recent 13F filing where we can see all of his current investments. And what I would love to do is I want to take all of his investments, I'm not gonna pick and choose, I wanna be fair to fill town, I'm not gonna cherry pick, I wanna run 
very quickly all of his investments through his very own product to try and highlight where all of his contradictions lie. All right, so the first one we're gonna do is Gildan Activewear, ticker G-I-L. And when we go to plug it into his product, you can see that uh, it's not all green. It's uh, all red and it's actually really hard on the eyes. Now, the first thing that stands out to me the most is that debt. You know, he talks about, like I just said, he wants to have uh, three years of current year earnings power to pay off all outstanding debt. Gildan has a lot more than three years. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through all of those other negative red looking ratios, but clearly, right off the bat, I'm already scratching my head. All right, but let's look at the next one. Maybe this one will be better. So the next one is Sturm Ruger & Company, which is a gun manufacturer. Not sure what your take is on that, but if we plug it into his uh, little product, uh, you know, this one is a bit better. So what stands out to me right away is management's ability to compound returns. And as you can see, they have been growing uh, return on invested capital and return on equity by at least 20% over the past decade. And they have no debt relative to their current year's earnings power. So this one makes a bit more sense, but it still isn't like that screenshot I showed earlier where it's all green. Okay, but maybe the third time is the charm. So let's plug in Ulta Beauty, which is actually a company that I was looking at last year. And I almost considered it until I saw the debt. Which again, Phil Town hates debt. At least that's what he says in his books and on his little podcast. Uh, so again, I'm just left scratching my head here because clearly they have, I think, over 10 years of debt. Okay, so his most recent investment is this next one, which is Sanderson Farm. And so I pulled it up and I was really excited. Maybe this one will be all green. No, no, it's not. You know, and in the book, Phil Town talks about how he prefers to value companies based on earnings per share, which is completely different than valuing companies based on free cash flow, which is the way Warren Buffett, Pabri, and Munger prefer to do it. So if we look at the EPS growth for this company, you can see that it is only going down. So again, I just don't get it. And you might say, oh, well, maybe at the time when he bought it, it was just too cheap to turn down, you know, a classic cigar butt situation. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe you're right. So I looked up the PE ratios and no, no, it, it's pretty expensive. It's selling at a PE ratio of around 20. But all right, let's move on to the next one, which is Bank OZK, which fun fact, guys, I actually own this stock too. And the reason I do is because when I put it into his subscription service, you can see it's all green. It is a great company. So this one, Phil Town did a good job in, and I think he started buying this uh, sometime last year around $25. Uh, per share and it's at like 42 43 so he definitely hit a home run here so the next one is the big dog berkshire hathaway good old warren buffett and honestly i'm kind of mixed on this one because i definitely see how you know you can't go wrong by giving your money to warren buffett but there is a part of me that if you consider yourself to be a professional investor then you should probably allocate money into individual stocks because people are trusting you to maximize returns and they don't want you to just repurpose their money uh, into another holding company but I'll let it go. I'll give it a pass because I like Warren Buffett. Uh, so I'm kind of indifferent on this one. So the next one is Huntington Ingalls. I don't know if I said that right, but this is actually one that I started looking into when I found out that he invested into this company. But when I read the 10K, I found out that they get the bulk of their revenue from government contracts. So they're reliant on the government for success. So the good news is that they have a lot of contracts lined up, which you can basically consider guaranteed revenue. So I can see why Phil Town saw this and was attracted to the opportunity. However, I could could be wrong, like full disclosure, I could be wrong, but I think he said somewhere in one of his books that he likes to buy companies that aren't dependent on others to see success. But you know, this one makes a little bit more sense. Still a little confusing, but I'll let this one go. Okay, so the next one is a gold mining company, which I think is really random, but Phil Town is a smart guy. So he probably knows something that I don't. But again, you can look at this screenshot and clearly see, yeah, this is just not lining up with what he preached in the book. Uh, the one good thing here is the low debt. So, you know, I'm sure he noticed that. Uh, but I want to point out the overall rule one score for this company, which is a 51. Now, guys, I'm here to tell you I have scored more 51 percents on uh, exams in my uh, academic career than I care to admit. And I was told that I was a failure. So if we apply that same rationality to this company, I don't know. You tell me if this was a good investment. So let's move on to the next one, which is CF Industries. I think they do fertilizer or something. But all I care about is this screenshot, which... Pff, like, I'm sorry. I mean, 
There's so much red here, it might as well be a stop sign. Like this is ridiculous. So let's just move on to the next one. So the next one is Armada Hoffler Properties, which is obviously real estate. And I was actually looking into this one uh, last year when I was looking at Seritage Growth Properties to compare these two opportunities. Uh, and the thing that stood out to me the most is debt, which honestly makes a little bit of sense for a real estate company. It's pretty capital intensive, but you know, you can see this is a rule one score of 61, better than a handful of the other ones, but still, uh, you know, not in line with what he's practicing in his book. So the last one here, you know, honestly, at this point, I really just don't care because this one doesn't make any sense to me either. It looks like he bought uh, shares in some sort of a gold ETF. You know, he doesn't say in the book, don't buy gold. And I'm sure this is a hedge against all of the inflation that is going on. And considering he has 30% cash, he doesn't want to lose any purchasing power. But, you know, he emphasizes so much in the book about buying, you know, cash producing assets. And he mentions Warren Buffett time and time again in his podcast and even in his book and Warren Buffett hates gold because it doesn't produce a cash flow. So, you know, nothing wrong with this investment, but it just doesn't really make sense from what I have understood to be Phil Town's investing method. Uh, and then you can see the last one there is a money market fund, which is just cash. Uh, but I don't want to be a dead horse anymore. Uh, you know, obviously he isn't practicing what he is preaching, which is a little upsetting because he did teach me so much about investing. But now I want to quickly talk about why I have been getting just such a weird con man slash salesy vibe from the guy. So guys, like I said, I actually use his very own product. And when I first bought the product, I had to give my email information like you usually do nowadays. You guys want to know how many emails I have got from Phil Town over the past month and a half alone. So guys, I actually work in marketing and back in my early days, I did email marketing and typically it is good practice to only send two newsletters per month or else you're going to come off as spammy, which Phil Town is because I'm going to put up this screenshot and you can see here that in the past month and a half alone, I have been getting bombarded by the guy. And I find this really interesting because I already converted into a customer like, dude, I'm a fan. Like get your automated email workflow to work properly where a customer isn't going to be bombarded with more advertising. A lot of the email campaigns that I've been getting from him are to direct me to his upcoming seminars and lectures that cost a lot of money. And you know, I just wish he would do something more like what Monish Pabrai does where he puts all of his lectures and Q and A sessions on his YouTube channel completely for free. So, you know, I got to give him some credit because he definitely taught me a lot and I honestly do still look up to him a bit, but you know, I do think he has tainted his reputation and I've lost a lot of credibility for the guy, but you know, let me know if you guys think I'm wrong. Uh, I'm sure in a lot of his investments, he knows something that I don't, but it's just really confusing. You know, I, I'm a big believer that you should be completely transparent with who you are and you should practice what you preach. That's why I show screenshots of all my investments and whatnot, because I want to be completely transparent in my content. But anyways, guys, I hope you guys like this video. Please feel free to leave a comment. I always like responding, but anyways, you guys are awesome and I'll see you guys in the next video.